It is often said that language makes us humans unique. Children in only a few years' time manage to master the basics of a highly complex symbolic system. This ability to use language has long fascinated philosophers, linguists and psychologists alike. And despite phenomenal advances in computing, we remain unable to design artificial systems with the same ability for language. How is it that we learn a language? Well, we don't really know for sure. Linguists have proposed a range of theories to explain this. Generative linguists insist that at least some knowledge must be available or present in babies at birth for them to acquire such a complex system as fast as they do. Usage-based linguists dispute this. They work from the hypothesis that exposure to language, being immersed in it, is sufficient. Humans do not need any special brain structures that deal with language only. General cognitive processes such as automatization, categorization and analogy are sufficient. Interesting for us in this episode is the fact that these general cognitive processes appear to be susceptible to frequency, that is frequency of occurrence. For example, the number of times the word language occurs in writing or speech. Linguistic theories have, I think, for a long, long time already been interested in frequency. And it's all driven by the the, the realization that we need to know about how language is used in under, to understand how we process it. But also, for instance, if you want to teach somebody else a second language, then it is very useful to know which ones are the words that are used frequently because those you want to teach first. So there's all kinds of practical applications. But then came a period in, uh, in linguistic thinking that was dominated by a very formal approach to language where you had basic alphabet of symbols and then rules operating on those symbols to give you words and then sentences and maybe even discourse. And those rules were basically assumed to be frequency free. So then linguistics entered into a 20, 30 year period where most of the research uh, was driven by a very prestigious way of thinking that underlyingly languages like logic and mathematics. In a way, logic and mathematical that is not contaminated by frequency. If you go into the field of mathematics, you have people who love logic, who love clean, clean systems. And then there's all the stuff that has to do with calculus and probability. Some mathematicians like the one and others like the other. So what people forgot in this time of uh, formal modeling is that there is a whole other branch of mathematics having to deal with statistics, with probability, with dealing with uncertainty. In recent years, we've seen more and more attention coming back to this uncertainty about our knowledge of language and about the role that experience plays in shaping how we deal with language. This is a bit of, of why, why frequency is very much back on the agenda. So how do linguists record information about the frequency of a linguistic experience? How do they find out how often the word language, for example, is used in English? What resources do they have at their disposal? Uh, frequency is, is something that's been really hard to study um, up until fairly recently, and I mean maybe the last 20 years. Because to study frequency, you have to look at kind of the amount of input that you get when you are hearing or, or reading a language, um, as well as a, a kind of a, a pretty good idea of what it is that people do on a really large scale. And until we had these massive text databases, both of spoken language and of written language, like we've had in the last 20 years, it's been really difficult to study frequency. What is corpus data? Corpus data is collections of naturally produced writing or speech and what is naturally basically all occasions where people use language, whether it's writing or speech. Writing, there is so much writing already available on the internet, so these days we have large internet corpora, so those are basically text collections downloaded, well websites downloaded or documents on the internet downloaded and then uh, put together in one large corpus. You have metadata that goes with it so that you know the exact source of these texts. 
In the old days, of course, people had to collect really written notes, so for historical linguistics that's very important, written things or printed books that were not digitally available, then they have to be digitized first and then you can put them in an electronic corpus. And speech corpora, they're probably the most difficult things to, to collect because there you really have to record or get recordings of, of spoken data, then transcribe them, so type out what's said in, in the speech and then put it in electronic corpora that you can search and do all kinds of statistical analysis on. Corpus data is the most authentic data we have in linguistics. It's not that the texts or the conversation that are in corpora were produced for the researcher, they were produced completely independent of the researcher. So that's why I think corpus data is our primary data source as linguists, because it's the most natural data we can have about language. But now we have these things, we can sort of start to look at the fact that each person gets some subset of this entire mass of data that's out there. We can look at it and kind of try and think about how, what they're getting and the proportions of different things that they're getting and the amounts of different things that they're getting may influence their own language, how they speak and how they understand things. And frequency is hugely important because it gives us information about how words are actually used by people, so how often they use a certain word to express a certain concept and so on. So it's our, it's our primary source of information how words are used by, by speakers in a, in a certain language community. At the moment, I'm working on um, variation in language. And um, when we think about variation, what we mean is often there are multiple ways of saying pretty similar or identical things. So, for example, we have words like car and automobile. That's called near synonymy. We might be able to use one or the other in a variety of situations. There are also kind of structural ways that this can work. So we might have multiple ways of saying pretty similar things, such as pack the van with boxes or pack boxes into the van. It means pretty much the same thing. Another way that this works is on the level of particular uh, forms. Um, and this is something that we don't have very much in, of in English because English is a form poor language. So for example, I might be able to say something like, I've proved that or I've proven that. And those two forms proved and proven are basically equivalent. We can use either one. And so the question is, when do we use one and when do we use the other? And does it make a difference? But it's not so much that it's frequency itself, because it's, if something occurs a lot or not a lot, well, okay, that's fine. It just describes the input that we get. And then I think the challenge is to say, okay, now where does this take us? Given that this is the input, what are the consequences for this kind of input for what we can learn about language? There are theories of linguistics which, which basically say this kind of variation more or less doesn't have a theoretical reason for existing. Um, so if we in fact have some sort of language acquisition device in our heads, as Chomsky says, then we should be basically getting all of this input, filtering out the stuff that is kind of just noise, and coming up with a single item to put in each of these slots that already pre-exists in our head. So the existence of this kind of variation is actually really problematic um, for certain linguistic theories. And it leads us to suggest that if this variation is consistent, and if it's maintained or keeps occurring in language over time, um, that maybe we need to come up with some sort of alternate way of, of looking at how language is acquired. Initially, linguists would access these corpora, these large databases of texts, and count, for example, how often they would encounter a word like car or automobile. Simply counting things gives us what we call raw frequencies. But raw frequencies are not in and of themselves and directly of interest for scientific investigation. Statisticians will tell us that we need to establish first whether patterns are likely to be systematic in the larger population before we assign any importance to them. So more sophisticated quantitative measures are needed. How can we collect information about frequency of occurrence in a way that satisfies both the needs of a linguist and that of a data scientist? Ah, there are, there are 
tons of measures uh, that one could use. Uh, a very popular one nowadays is called surprisal, which is not much more than minus the log out of the relative frequency. So if you take, say, the word like television occurs 10,000 times in a million words, then you can take 10,000 divided by a million, that gives you the relative frequency, you take a binary log of that and put a minus in front, and then you can call it surprisal. It's a very popular reformulation of frequency. Trying to make simple and core course definition of what uh, information theory is, it's a formal theory or mathematical theory of communication. What's interesting for us who are trying to do and understand language is to see a system, language as a system or as a mean of communication. What's very often characteristic for people who are doing language is that they are concentrated only on language itself. And somehow they forget the context and the people who actually communicate and use that language to exchange information. And that's where information theory can, can be very useful, because it provides broader scope on the phenomena. It includes the speaker and the receiver, people who communicate, people who try to, as they sometimes in information theory say, negotiate code books, because I uh, choose certain words and sentences to pass this message to you, and then you also have your decoding book and say, aha, he means that and not something else. And uh, information theory provide like mathematical formal means to express the complexities and other aspects of this kind of communication system. The attractive thing about borrowing measures from information theory is that they have been applied widely. Take entropy, for example. It's the most curious concept that pops up from thermodynamics to Russian literature. This broad area of application provides us with a unique opportunity to link up research across a number of areas and explain a range of phenomena in a unified way. Entropy is just the term for uncertainty. And it's been used in linguistics in a wide range of areas, pretty much in all areas of linguistics, from sound patterns through morph morphological systems up through sentence processing. And uh, entropy is uh, one formal way to um, express, in, in, in formal in mathematical sense, to express complexity in the system. If you have more than one choice in the system at any point of time, you can say, okay, there is an uncertainty. I can use word A, B, C, D, and uh, can I express somehow formally with some specific number how uncertain you will be while receiving my message in which word or what meaning at the end I will try to communicate with you. And the entropy is just a mathematical way to express the amount of uncertainty in the system. And what uh, communication or language is, is it's kind of a dynamic process of navigating this uncertainty. So my role, if I am trying to tell you something in this particular moment, is to navigate and not allow too much uncertainty, because then I'm in danger that you will not understand what I want to pass as an information. And uh, at the same time, you also come in this communication system with this assumption that I will try to pass you a message with minimum amount of uncertainty navigating through the process. That's the one way of explaining what uh, entropy can bring into language, understanding how we uh, engage, because how we engage language in communication and in information transmission. And uh, if there is no information, then uh, language would be obsolete because you will know everything, I will know everything, so no, no need to exchange any information. And then what level of uncertainty is good, useful, uh, right for us to exchange information that are in our interest? There are many measures in, in information theory that are fun, but one that I have found particularly interesting, and it's, I didn't think of it, a colleague of mine, Pater Millen, uh, did, uh, is one called uh, relative entropy. And let me try to explain what this is about. Take the prepositions of English, up, under, above, below, 
through, etc. Let's say we make a list of 80 prepositions, a long list of prepositions. And for each preposition, we count how often it occurs in some big text collection, maybe the British National Corpus or the whole yearly edition of The Guardian from 2000 to 2006. Okay. Then what we will find is that some prepositions are used very frequently and others are somewhat used less frequently. So maybe in has a relative frequency of, say, five out of a hundred. Every hundred prepositions you have five times in and maybe uh, two times under and seven times through, etc. Now we can also take a particular word, let's say table. And we look how the different prepositions occur with table. And of course we have things on the table and under the table and next to the table, but in the table is going to be less frequent. Now we can compare the relative frequencies of the prepositions as they occur with table with the relative frequencies of the prepositions as they occur in the language. Now if those two columns of probabilities are very similar, then, you know, we can say they have a very low distance to each other. But they can also be very dissimilar. And one of the interesting findings that Peter Millin first documented is that uh, how if you present just the word table in isolation, uh, then its distance of how it uses prepositions to this general column of uh, prepositional probabilities matters, even if there's no context. Just table, uh, you have to say whether it's a word or not, then you're slow if these two vectors of probabilities are very different, and you're fast if they're very similar. And that shows you that our knowledge of how words occur in context matters even when we hear the words without the context. That is, for me, one of the jewels of uh, information theoretical measures uh, within the context of morphology and morphological processing. Can we actually literally use and understand entropy and other concepts from information theory and directly translate into language system or communication system? Well, the simple answer is no, because in my opinion, all those measures like entropy or others like relative entropy and perplexity, and we have dozens of those, are just proxies, in my opinion. I don't think that we actually doing, uh, do all the time online entropy calculation while we communicate. We are not entropy calculator when we process language. It's just a nice indicator to say how complex the process is at any point of time and in time. Another avenue that was opened up by this interest in numbers, this so-called quantitative turn in linguistics, is the possibility to link with disciplines that approach language from a mathematical perspective, such as, for example, computer science. Computer scientists have developed a range of machine learning techniques, a type of artificial intelligence that makes it possible for computers to learn without explicitly being programmed. And linguists have, have made use of these algorithms in two different ways. On the one hand, they've used them to solve practical problems they encounter in their work, but they've also made use of them to learn more about how humans acquire language. I have found various machine learning techniques and am still finding various machine learning techniques very, very useful. The problem with understanding lots of linguistic phenomena is that it looks like there's zillions of different factors that are at issue. People have been realizing that all those kind of factors all are active simultaneously, some more strongly, others less strongly. This is where various machine learning techniques can become very, very useful because they will often tell you, you know, you say, okay, I have to classify. Is it this order or that order? So we have basically a simple classification problem and we have maybe 20 or 30 different kinds of predictors. And then these machine learning techniques will, at the end of the day, give you a fairly good indication of which of your predictors are the most important ones. So you can get all kinds of nice measures like variable importances out of that. So in that sense, machine learning has lots to offer. Today I can say uh, machine learning has uh, relatively developed theory or, or uh, um, um, 
list of available princi principles of learning. And um, it's interesting to try more than just one and to see what are differences and similarities between them and when they fit to what humans do and when they diverge from human behavior and then we can understand what's that specific in human language processing that makes that critical difference. But if you combine more than one technique, you can get kind of a more comprehensive picture of what's that specific, what are components of, of human language processing. Some of these machine learning models have been around for a very long time and their roots can be traced back to linguistics. An example of such a model would be that based on distributional learning. Now how do distributional models work? Uh, they start from uh, an assumption that's, well, from, from a premise that's already been expressed in the 1950s, where you say words that have the same meaning tend to have the same context words around them. So you shall know a word by the company it keeps. That's a famous adagium from John Rupert Firth. That idea is basically at the heart of distributional models. You look at the context words of specific words, and then you will try to find two words that have approximately the same words around them, like underground and tube, will have words around them like train or transport or delays, <laughs> unfortunately as well. But from these context words they have in common, a computer can then infer that. So you can quantify this, how many context words they have in common, relative to other words which, which they do not have contact words in common, but you can then quantify this and a computer can do this for you, importantly, to automatically find near synonyms, so words that uh, refer to the same concept, and then you can start uh, studying lexical variation. Other models originate within computer science. These models are usually very powerful and apply across a range of domains, but they do not always address the questions that linguists and cognitive linguists in particular are interested in. The most important question for such linguists would be, can we learn anything about how humans acquire and use language from looking at computational models? Of course, right now, uh we have uh, the deep learning networks that have become very, very uh, uh, influential and can be an excellent way to improve, say, automatic speech recognition models. Uh, but with those kind of techniques, I am a little bit hesitant when thinking about my basic interest in understanding how language works in our brains. These deep learning networks look so nice because they are neural networks and hence they start looking like neurons and don't we have lots of neurons in our brains? But the technology that is used in order to train these networks is biologically completely implausible. We are seeing right now already that with uh, Artificial intelligence people have developed games that beat the best chess player and recently we have seen that there are now algorithms that can beat the best Go player, something that 10 years ago was seen totally impossible. We are now doing it. So it's very likely that in 10 or 15 years we will have reasoning systems that outsmart us. Now that doesn't mean that the techniques that come from these AI and, and machine learning, that they will be very useful for understanding the way we work, because one of the things that we will have to do if we want to understand ourselves is restrict ourselves to those models for which we have good evidence that they approximate how the brain works and have the limitations that come with how our brains work. So what does this interest in frequencies, this quantitative turn, mean for linguistics as a discipline and for linguistic theory in particular? What are the new challenges awaiting linguists and what are the best ways of addressing them? One uh, involves uh, building a bridge between uh, what we as linguists, as, uh, uh, as members of a kind of community that continues the kind of uh, philological traditions that have been established, the things that we know about language and the robust analytic techniques that have been developed in other domains, domains like biology, computer science, and engineering. And bringing those kinds of robust techniques 
that have been used on complex data in other domains to bear on the kinds of questions that linguists have traditionally uh, grappled with. This is, you know, it's partly, it's partly a matter of using not, uh, the nat natural language processing domain as a kind of uh, a kind of a, as a kind of a connecting domain, a connecting subject between linguistics and engineering. The second main problem, challenge I would identify is more kind of institutional, and that is to facilitate things like collaboration, cross-training of students, and allow a kind of multidisciplinary approaches to to find some natural home in university systems that are divided up rather unhelpfully into faculties. The research problems we face as a field are inc increasingly dependent on expertise that no single individual tends to command. Knowledge of languages, control of corpora, knowledge of techniques for analyzing corpora, and good command of statistics and experimental design. Finding individuals that are knowledgeable about all of those things is hard enough, but finding any single individual who is uh, uh, has, has expertise in those areas is, 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 is very difficult. So we need to, we need to create the environment, an environment which students can get cross-training, which uh, research teams can operate across discipline boundaries. I think that uh, language is very complex and we actually need people from different fields, from different backgrounds to deal with this very complex beast, which is complex, dynamic, it changes over, over time. And uh, what I think it's, it's, it's going on currently is a sort of a nice integration with the certain schools in linguistics, like uh, cognitive linguistics, which always was aware and, and uh, paid close attention to cognitive or psychological aspects of language and what's in language use was very important and central to them and that's very close to ideas that are developed in, in uh, psychology. So there is a clear common interest between those two subfields or theoretical approaches. For machine learning, people as they advance seeing uh, statistics and learning mechanisms and, and modules, they can bring better and better tools for psychology and linguistics to analyze language data. What are the main conclusions we can draw from all of this? What has our interest in frequency taught us? And maybe more importantly, should we continue this line of investigation, or is it time to reconsider the way we think about frequency and the effects it has on language use and processing? I think one of the things that, one of the real advances in the last um, 10 or 15 years in the work on frequency is the understanding that frequency is massively confounded with other factors. Um, and that, in fact, the, there isn't really a plausible model of counter in the head where actually speakers are tracking the number of occurrences of things. That what is clearly happening is there's some way that speakers are sensitized to a number of uh, different contexts in which things occur or other distributional patterns that are strongly correlated with frequency. So that in a way the idea of frequency as a thing has tended to give way to a, a sense that frequency is a good measure of other things that are actually more directly cognitively relevant and that uh, more effort is being expended in understanding those, comparing them, looking at different cases in which they diverge and coming to better understanding of how speakers actually control the quantitative dimensions of, of their language experience. I think really that uh, we should step back and rethink and redesign the way we approach the frequency. I think it's very important, it's crucial, it's all over the place, but people are sometimes getting overly excited about frequencies, so they claim that we don't have just uh, word frequencies, we have phrasal frequencies, many different types of frequencies, and it's just not possible, it's too expensive. We will have an explosion of number of possibilities to count in language and then on top of that it's not only about language we also deal with other things in our world so then we need to count everything and it's just too much so my final message would be to to consider frequency seriously but to try to uh, really rethink and reconceptualize what that means for language and otherwise